Well, good morning. Welcome. If I've never met you before, my name is Robert Denard. I'm the pastor here at Garden Ridge Assembly. It's a privilege to be able to share God's word with you today. And what we're doing this morning is actually re-recording yesterday's message. During the Sunday morning service, we had some audio issues that affected our upload and we didn't have any audio. And so we're just re-recording this today to make sure that all those folks that maybe weren't able to attend in person or who normally watch online are able to share in the message. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open that up to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 16 today. And as you're turning there, I want to remind you that this coming Sunday, our service times are changing. We've been having service at 9 and 11 a.m. for quite some time now. Well, this Sunday, we're making that change that we've been talking about. So beginning this Sunday morning, services will now be at 10 and 11.30 a.m. with Kids Church at both services. If you watch online, then your service will be at 11.30 a.m. So, so excited about that. That's a big step for the church here. We're excited about what God is doing. Let's pray and then get into God's word together. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the privilege that it is to be able to share your word. God, will you make each one of us ready to receive it? Do something fresh in us today. God, give us ears that would hear. Give us eyes that would see and a heart to receive and understand what you would say to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So I'm going to begin reading out of Matthew chapter 26 and verse 1. We're going to go through verse 16. God's word says this. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they plotted to arrest Jesus in some sly way and kill him. But not during the feast, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. I tell you the truth, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Verse 14, then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? Today, we're beginning a new message series that's going to take us through the next several weeks all the way to Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday. The name of the series is 30 Silver Coins. You ever noticed how no one names their their kid Judas anymore? A name, like several, is, is pretty much off the table. Well, in the passage that we just read, what we saw is, is what's called a, a, a juxtaposition. And what a juxtaposition is, is, is that means two things that are obviously in contrast with one another are placed side by side. And so we, we see two people in, the, in those passages that are, that are talked about. And the first person is the, the woman. This is the well-known story of a woman who comes in to where Jesus is and pours this expensive jar of perfume on him. And the disciples' response, as we clearly see, is not positive to this. Perfume is extravagant. They, they said it's, it's expensive, and so the money could have been used for it. It could have been sold, and the money used to, to give to the poor. Also, in the way that she poured this perfume on him, that's an expression that's normally reserved for the dead. It's, it's a prophetic kind of thing, that which Jesus even mentions. He says, she did this to prepare me for burial. You think the way that they would embalm or, or anoint a body in those days to prepare it for placing it in a tomb. And someone may have even said, you know what, someone did this already. Why are you doing this now? Because that incident is described in Luke chapter 7 as a separate incident from this one. And so this this anointing Jesus with oil thing there and and the way that this woman comes in in this humble way, that's something that happens twice with, with two different people. 
And so just like so many other times in Jesus' ministry, the disciples just don't get it. They don't get the point. But Jesus does. Jesus knows exactly what's on the horizon. He knows that the cross, which his whole ministry had been leading to, is just around the corner. It's literally just days away. And though no one else in the room is even really aware of that, they don't really understand what Jesus has been saying. They don't get it. Jesus is vividly aware that it's so close. And he even goes so far as to say very clearly, she's preparing me for my death. She's preparing me for my my burial. And so that's one person that's mentioned, the woman that comes in and and anoints Jesus and pours out that, that oil on him or that perfume, excuse me, on him. And the other person that's mentioned in the passage is Judas, or Judas Iscariot. And with hindsight, of course, with the benefit of Scripture in mind, we know that Judas is a villain. Scripture makes that clear from the beginning. It even describes him as the disciples are listed. It describes him as Judas Iscariot, who would later betray him. So we have the benefit of of knowing what's coming. One of the other gospels, as it describes this scene, is, is clear that, that when those people, the other disciples it describes, are in the room complaining about the waste. Why this waste? Why is this perfume being uh, poured out in this way and wasted in this way? Well, the disciples are saying that, but it's, Ju- uh, it's Judas who's the one who's doing most of the talking there. He's leading that. And there's the difference. Do you catch it? On the one hand, you've got This woman, and and by the way, the other gospels clarify that that's actually Mary who comes in and anoints Jesus with that perfume in that humble way. She comes in quite shamelessly and makes a scene. It's hard to not notice this. It's hard to avoid it. She makes this scene by, by pouring that expensive perfume on Jesus' head. It's an act of sacrifice. It's an act of, of worship. It's shameless. It's selfless. And remember, we've said before on, on numerous occasions that worship is an act of giving unto God. It's an act of honoring him, not receiving from him. Although the word is clear that, that God inhabits the praises of his people, and, it, and it's an incredible thing to be able to feel the presence of God as we worship him. Worship is just really us giving to God, giving our best to him. And that's what this woman is doing. It's a shameless, selfless act of worship as she anoints him with that perfume. And then you've got Judas. And while the woman was concerned only with worship, only with with giving, Judas, on the other hand, is a taker. He's a taker. He's only looking for what he can get out of this situation. How can this benefit me? Have you ever known someone like that personally, where their their only concern in any situation seems to be what they can get out of it, how that can benefit them? Even if it's as simple as just doing something nice for someone else, they want to make sure that someone else saw it so then they can, they can get some kind of a, a credit for it. You know, it never fails as a minister when election season rolls around, and I'm sure other ministers could tell you the same thing, but when election season rolls around, I get emails and I get phone calls from politicians or, for the, or, or from the campaigns of politicians, and it's always the same. They'll say, candidate so-and-so or, or incumbent such-and-such wants to have a conversation with, with local faith leaders like you to discuss the important issues, and, and you are invited. And it's the first time... That, that, that happened, I went, wow, that's really something. And then as it continued to happen, I recognized, okay, that's just, that's pandering. That's what, that's, that's politics. It's obvious pandering. So, you know, look how religious I am. I want to have conversations with, with local religious leaders. The, the, the fact of the matter really is that when they do that, they want your minister or your pastor to have a good impression of them as a candidate so that he will tell you and you'll go out and vote for that person. And that's just not something that I'm willing to do. That's politics, concern with, with someone thinking better of me because maybe I've done something good, but I, I do something not, not good for the sake of doing something good or not good for the sake of, of serving God, but so that other people will, will see me as good. And Jesus is, is very clear that, that when you do good deeds for the purpose of, of other people seeing you, 
Well, then you've already received your reward. Scripture is clear that greed was a motivating factor in Judas' life. Judas, again, was a taker. Judas seems to be primarily concerned with what he can get out of following Jesus in the here and now. We're going to get into that. You ever thought about that? Judas is concerned with, with following Jesus because of what he thinks he can get out of it in the here and now. Greed is that major motivating factor in Judas's life. But the problem is that, that Jesus and the disciples weren't rich. They didn't live a life of luxury. They weren't well-to-do. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 8, the Bible talks about how when a certain man came to Jesus and said, I want to follow you, Jesus said, foxes have dens. This is Matthew chapter 8, verse 20. Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. What that means is don't follow me if you're looking for a life of comfort and ease. That's not something that I've come to provide. So if that's the case and Judas is a taker, why is he following him? The answer is power. He's looking for what he can get out of this in the here and now. Think about this. I'm making a little bit of an inference here, but, but this is not a stretch. This is not much of an inference that I'm making. Judas is looking for power. Think about the ministry of Jesus. As you read through the Gospels and you see the way that his ministry is described, what do, what do you see? Jesus goes from town to town, and when he goes to a town and he teaches and preaches, what happens? massive crowds begin to amass. His following continues to grow. People are drawn to his words. And people are even beginning to say, I think he's the Messiah. Judas is an opportunist. Judas is looking for a way to get ahead. And so I think that Judas saw Jesus as a ticket to wealth, influence, and power. If you look at Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 28, Jesus' words are, are this. He says, truly I tell you, at the, renewal, excuse me, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, throne's a big word, especially to someone like Judas, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. So Judas, here's Jesus saying these things. He hears that, that language about sitting on 12 thrones judging people, inheriting a hundred times as much. And he sees the size of the crowds who have, have come to Jesus. And Judas sees this as a means to an end. Remember, it, it's not that, that he's the only disciple who necessarily thinks at least in this vein, that Jesus is coming to set up an earthly kingdom. All of the disciples had been conditioned, the people, the, the Jews, Israel had been conditioned to, to think over time that, that when the Messiah came, he was coming to set up an earthly kingdom. They believed that's what the Messiah was coming to do, to set them free from Roman oppression and to, to bring Israel back to a place of prominence as it had been in the times of, of King David and Solomon and some of those kings after them. And so over and over again, the disciples make it clear that they're waiting for Jesus to establish his, his kingdom, and they're thinking that it's this earthly, physical kingdom at the time. But by the time you get to the passages that we started with, in Matthew chapter 26, by the time you, you get there, Judas is beginning to see things very differently. Jesus' language has, has kind of changed. The, the people that he's hanging out with aren't what you would call politically expedient. right? Th think about that. If Jesus was going to start a revolution, which is what Judas thought he was there to do, if Jesus was going to start a, a revolution, if he's going to overthrow Rome and establish Israel in that physical way again, then, then it would have made sense to at least try to align himself with people of power and influence. Primarily, the Pharisees would have been that first major group that he would need to get with. The people looked to the Pharisees for leadership, for certainly religious leadership, but also some, some 
type of political leadership there in some ways as well. And so it would have made so much sense in, in Judas's eyes and in anyone's eyes if Jesus was going to set up an earthly kingdom then that, that he would need to align himself with. And that's what you do in politics. You look for alliances. You look for donors and, and all those things. And that's not at all what Jesus did. He didn't set himself up with the, the powerful or the wealthy, excuse me, or the wealthy or the influential. Instead, he calls out those folks. And he calls out the Pharisees specifically and the religious leaders specifically. He is completely unconcerned with offending the rich, the powerful, and the influential. He never talks about physically overthrowing Roman rule. Instead, who's he hanging out with? Tax collectors, prostitutes, lepers, sinners. And so finally, Judas figures out, this is not what I thought I was signing up for. It's time for me to get out of this thing. Here I've been traveling from town to town, essentially homeless for the last three years, hanging out with some of these sinners and, and weirdos, thinking that there's going to be some kind of a big payoff at the end of this thing. And now Jesus is talking about going to Jerusalem and, and dying. Okay, that's enough. I've had it. This is, this is not working out the way that it, it, it could have. It's not working out the way that I think that it, that it should have worked out. It's sure not working out for me. It's time for me to get out of this thing. Time for me to cut a deal. And that's exactly what we see Judas do in those verses. I don't know that this television show is still actually airing on TV or not, but, but I remember there's a, there's a game show called Deal or no deal. You familiar with that? And the whole premise of deal or no deal is opening suitcases that could have money in them, but could have uh, not, could have nothing in them. And so the, the premise of this television show, and, and, and I was hooked, I got to tell you, I, I liked this one. It's so simple. But deal or no deal, they would line up something like uh, maybe 25 suitcases, and they, they would all have a number on them, you know, one through 25. And a contestant would come and, and pick just a suitcase at random. There was no way of really telling if there was a high amount of money inside the suitcase or not. But they would take that suitcase and they would set it aside. And then the rest of the, of the game show was them picking other suitcases to open. And as they opened them, they would see if they had high dollar amounts or low dollar amounts. And of course, the, the, the lowest dollar amount, I believe, was one cent, you know, a penny. And the highest dollar amount was a million dollars. And so you just hope that you picked the million dollar suitcase. And so you'll open, you know, five or six suitcases at a time. And then this third party uh, banker, uh, would, would call and try to cut a deal with you. And so if you had opened several suitcases, let's say you had opened 10 of the suitcases and they all had low dollar amounts in them, maybe a, you know, the penny suitcase, the $3 suitcase, the $10 suitcase, well, then maybe that, that banker would call and make you an offer and say, look, you might have the million-dollar suitcase, but you may not. And so I'll make you an offer for $20,000 or $100,000 right now if you trade me that suitcase for it. And that way, it, because it's better for the banker to lose out on $20,000 than to possibly have to lose out on $100,000 and vice versa for the contestant. It was suspenseful. I don't know that many people actually won the million dollars, but it was a game of risk or a game of chance. Another game show I remember was, uh, I'm sure you remember this one, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And that's probably 20 years ago that it was uh, in its prominence there, but that, that was a big one. And, and the whole idea behind that was you answer questions, and as you start off, they're easy. You, you win a small amount of money, but the further along you go, you risk the money that you've made, but you've got to answer much harder and harder questions, up to probably a million dollars toward the end. It's all about risk. And what you've got to do is determine if the potential benefit outweighs the risk. And that's game shows, right? That's certainly any kind of, of, of gambling uh, would be that. Even the stock market, even the, your, your 401k, if you, if you have one, there's, there's risk associated there. Your, your money could, could grow or it could, it could shrink. Jesus was clear all along. There's not risk involved. There's an absolute certainty that when you trust in him, when you make him the Lord of your life, when you're born again, as the Bible says, it's not risk. It's an absolute certainty. You have eternal life. John chapter 3 says, if anyone believes in him, they shall not perish but have eternal life. So there's no risk, but Jesus is also very clear. There is a cost to that. 
There's a cost. It's not a gamble. It's a sure thing. You receive eternal life, but there is a cost. Matthew chapter 10, verse 22 said this, all men will hate you because of me. And then in verse 38, also in Matthew chapter 10, he says, take up your cross and follow me. And so Jesus isn't talking about a life of comfort or a life of ease. He never did that. And at this point, finally, in what we've read in Judas's journey, Judas has had enough. If all that is true, which we believe that the Bible, obviously, we know that the Bible is true. But if what we've inferred about Jesus, or excuse me, about Judas here is true, you know what I see? You know what I see about Judas? What I see here is that, that Judas Iscariot is quite possibly the first person to come up with and get burned by the prosperity gospel. You catch that? Judas comes up with and burns himself with the prosperity gospel. Think about it. This is not a stretch whatsoever. If Judas is following Jesus based on what he can get out of it in the here and now, that's essentially the prosperity gospel. That, that's that's the, the gospel that says, because of my relationship with Jesus, I'm going to be rich. Or because of my relationship with Jesus, I'm going to have a, a nice home. Or because of my relationship with Jesus, I'm going to be a person of influence. Look, you're already called to be an influencer for the kingdom of God. Because of my relationship with Jesus, I'm going to have the big house and the nice car on the big side of town. But that's not what Jesus promises. And when we get into a relationship with him, thinking that it is, we're setting our, ourselves up for a whole lot of disappointment. And by the way, it's just poor theology. But it seems like Judas decided on the deal that 30 pieces of silver would be better than whatever he had thought Jesus was able to provide. By the way, have you ever wondered how much 30 pieces of silver would be in today's terms? Have you ever thought that through? We think sometimes, well, it's precious metals. It's probably worth a whole lot of money. Have you ever thought that through? How much do you think that 30 pieces of silver was worth in today's terms? You want the answer? Estimate, give or take, about $500. Can you believe that? $500. It's easy to look back at Judas and be shocked. And we should be. The name Judas is synonymous with betrayal. If someone's called a Judas, it means they're a backstabber. And because of that, I think it's even easy to look back and, and see the, Judas the man as sort of a, a caricature. You know, someone with, with shifty eyes that it's obvious to, to see that, that they're a, a bad guy. And, and, and maybe, but honestly, probably not. All of his dirty work, all of Judas, excuse me, all of Judas's dirty work was done in secret. And we know that because the disciples didn't suspect a thing, at least not that we read about. A couple days after this, when, when Jesus and the disciples are at the Last Supper, what do you see? Jesus tells the disciples, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. And when Jesus says that, the response of the disciples is not that 11 heads immediately turned and looked at Judas and said, well, obviously it's him, the guy that comes in here wearing the long black coat and the black hat, and he's got the, the handlebar mustache, and when he laughs, he does it like this, ha right? And it's, it's, it, it's funny to say it that way, but the reality is they didn't know. The Bible says the disciples looked to one another wondering who it could be. Judas was just as much part of the family as Peter or James or John or Andrew or any of the rest. They were shocked when they found out that it was Judas that had betrayed Jesus. Everything that he did behind the back was secret, as sin so often is. And so when Judas finally decides but he's not going to get rich off of Jesus. He's not going to get the material blessing. He's not going to get the influence that he was hoping for. 
he decides to make that trade. Figured out, you know, I'm not going to get an earthly throne. So he said, I'll make a deal and at least I'll get something out of it. $500 isn't much, but it's better than nothing. And so Judas sold Jesus out for what equates today is less than one month's rent. For some of you watching today, less than your car payment. 30 pieces of silver. Judas came to Jesus to get what he wanted. And when he couldn't, he traded Jesus to get what he wanted. Judas didn't get rich off of 30 pieces of silver, but, and catch this, it was enough at the time. You see that? He knew he wouldn't get rich off 30 pieces of silver. But it was enough at the time for him to take the deal. It ain't much, but it's enough for right now. It's enough at the time to make him take the deal. Thank goodness you and I would never do something like that. Selling out Christ for such a small amount. Come on. We'd never do something like that, would we? Saints, we do it all the time. All the time. What does it take to make you compromise your values? For some people, it's money. For some people, it's a little bit of extra power or or influence. Maybe the chance to see a little extra skin. What form does your own personal 30 pieces of silver Take. What does it take to make you compromise your values? It's an important question, but if we're honest with ourselves, it's probably one that you already know the answer to. What does it take to make a person trade away what's most important for what they want, what I want right now in this moment? It won't last, but it'll be okay for right now. It's enough in the moment. You see, we were created in the image of God. But if we're honest with ourselves, there are times when we look in the mirror and there's Judas staring right back at us. That last verse that we started with today, verse 16, said, from then on, he, talking about Judas, from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. He was ready to betray Jesus, but he was just looking for the right opportunity. He was still around, he was still there, but he was just waiting for the moment where he could get what he wanted next. You know, sometimes people do, and I'm sure you've heard this term before, they play church. They look like a follower of Jesus. Maybe they they go to church or they have one of those little Jesus fish on their car, or maybe they even listen to K-Love, and all that's fine. But the reality is they're regularly waiting for the right opportunity to trade him in for what looks good right now. If that's you today, and you feel it, and you know it, I hope that today, even in this moment, you'll say, it is time for me to make a change. Judas's story ends in tragedy. It ends in a a field. You see, after Judas turned his back on Jesus and and traded him in, he knew the the pain and the sorrow of regret. He felt so terrible. It ate him up so bad inside that he ends up going back to the priest and and he throws that money back to them and then he goes off and he kills himself. He made an idol out of wealth and and power and he never saw what real wealth was. Real wealth is eternal life. Life abundant, as Jesus says in John chapter 10. He never ended up, Judas never ended up knowing the opportunity for forgiveness or for restoration that was available through Christ himself. And so in my opinion, the story of Judas is one of the saddest stories in all of the Bible. His life ended in tragedy. He never saw the glory of the resurrection. He never knew the hope of forgiveness and that promise of new life that only Jesus can provide. But you and I can. 
Every person who has ever lived, every person who attends this church, every person, every person who's watching online or who may, may hear this at some point in the future, every one of us has something in common with Judas, whether we like to believe it or not. Each one of us, every person who's ever lived has something in common with Judas Iscariot. And you know what it is? Here you go. We are all, just like Judas, sinners. We're all sinners. The Bible says that not just some, but all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. We're sinners. I'm a sinner. And no matter how hard I try, I will always be a sinner. No matter how much I try to do better, no matter how much I try to get it right, no matter how hard I try to be a good person or do good deeds or do something for my, for my neighbor or the person next door or the, or the homeless person on the street or my wife or my kids, I will always be a sinner. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. See, the, the, the Bible says that punishment for sin is death. It's eternal separation from God. But that gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And that gift, no matter what you and I have done in the past, no matter how bad you think that you've blown it, no matter how many times you've come back and asked for forgiveness and tell God that you're sorry and you think that, well, I can't do it again, no matter how many times you've done that before, no matter what you've done, that gift is available for you today if you'll make the choice to receive it. Can we bow our heads? Will you join with me in an attitude of, of prayer, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. I just want to ask you personally, and really this is between you and, and God, what's your 30 pieces of silver? What's that thing that you've been willing to compromise your, your values for what have you been, if we're honest, what have you been willing to trade Christ for? More than likely, you don't even have to spend any time thinking about it because your conscience has already told you. You already know. You see, like Judas, you and I are sinners. But unlike Judas, we have the benefit of being able to look back and see the victory of the cross, the victory of the knowledge that Jesus Christ loves us. He loves you. And he died for you on that cross. And on the third day, the Bible is so clear that he rose again and he's given us the opportunity for eternal life. If we'll receive it. If we'll reach out to him and say yes. We mentioned earlier, John chapter three said that if a person believes in him, if a person believes in Jesus, then they would be saved. They would not perish, but they would have everlasting life. That means eternal life. That means forever life. And so if you've not yet done so, I hope that right now in this moment, you'll make that decision to say yes to Jesus. It doesn't take a long, verbose, King James Version kind of a prayer. You just be real and honest with him. And even in this moment, will you just say this? Will you surrender to him? Just, you can just pray this. Just say, Jesus, I recognize that I am a sinner. Just like Pastor Robert said, he's a sinner. I am a sinner. And no matter how hard I try, I recognize I can't earn my way to you. And I recognize your gift available to me of eternal life through Jesus. So Jesus, I ask, will you please forgive me for my sins? Be the Lord of my life. Be in charge of my life. Be the savior of my soul. I surrender to you. Help me now to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, I believe that you're born again. I believe that you have eternal life. I believe Jesus is now Lord of your life. You've been born again in that Bible way. I hope that you'll tell somebody about it. I'd love for you to tell me. Send me an email to prayer 
at GardenRidgeAssembly.org. O-R-G. That's a confidential email address. That comes right to me. And if you've got special prayer needs, you can use that as well. But I would love to know. Tell me, tell someone else. And next up, make sure that you get into the Bible. Begin reading at least a chapter of the New Testament every day. And if you're not already, get into a Bible-believing church. This is a good one. But if you're not close by, find one near you that teaches and believes the Bible and get involved. Well, like I said, if you need special prayer, send me an email to prayer at gardenridgeassembly.org. It's such a privilege to share God's word with you today. God bless you as you go throughout your week this week, and I'll see you next time. God bless you.